Okay, so welcome everybody. Uh, people are still joining, but I'll start uh, talking a few words. So this is uh, the last uh, webinar of the year of the Intercity Project. Uh, the Intercity Project is a joint consortium of several universities uh, in Brazil in which we carry out research related to data science, computer science, and smart cities. And we have a few international collaborations and uh, one of our closest to the heart collaboration is with the MIT Science Facility Lab, uh, the group in which Fabio Duarte uh, leads several projects. So it's great to, to end the year with a guest talk by Fabio Duarte. Uh, Fabio is a principal research scientist in the MIT Sensible City Lab and a lecturer in transportation and planning at MIT's Department of Urban Studies and Planning. He has released a book uh, recently called Urban Play, Make Believe, Technology and Design. And the, the book was published by MIT Press and we had actually uh, about two weeks ago a lecture from his co-author here uh, in this series of webinars. Uh, Fabio Duarte, he's a urbanist. He has a degree, if I'm not mistaken, a degree in architecture from the Uni University of Sao Paulo. And he has a very special position in the Sensible City Lab in MIT because I, I had the luck to to be there for a semester working with them and saw the great work uh, that Fabio does because Fabio has the role of, of making sure that all the projects are working well or the, the researchers and postdocs are having the, the best environment for them to, uh, to produce the best results. And Fabio always have good scientific insights from uh, from an urbanistic point of view, and he has a very broad knowledge of this topic. So thank you very much, Fabio, for joining us today. Uh, as you can see, this is actually a special day for us because we are coming back to the physical location of the University of Sao Paulo. You can see we have about 10 people here watching uh, in presence, uh, besides the, the other people that are remotely. So thank you very much, Fabio. You have now 30 minutes and then we'll have time for questions. Good. Fabio, thank you very much for, for the introduction and for the invitation. Uh, it was great to have you here. Uh, it was better last time that I had the opportunity to give the lecture uh, in presence uh, uh, in this, but today it would, it, it would be more difficult. So I will give it this lecture here online. And I will share with you three projects, then we can open for, for questions. Uh, first, you need to, to let uh, me share the screen. You have to change the setting. Then. Okay, done. Okay, cool. Thank you. Let me share with sound. Yes. A very brief introduction uh, about the Sensible City Lab. So, for those who haven't uh, seen the website yet, but uh, the Sensible City Lab is part of MIT, and we are a very special lab because uh, we are within the Department of Urban Studies and Planning. Uh, even though the researchers working with us, they have a very broad uh, uh, perspective about cities. So we have mathematicians, computer scientists, physicists, but also designers, urban planners, uh, and economists, and environmental scientists now. And so this range of different researchers give a very uh, special uh, light uh, to the way we see cities. So here you can see several projects that we've been conducting in, 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 in recent years. And uh, along the arc, you see the researchers. And you can see that one researcher usually works in many projects. And also, each project has the contribution of many researchers. 
And this gives a good balance between uh, different fields. So sometimes uh, a computer scientist comes and start discussing a problem. And then it's nice to hear uh, feedback from an economist who sees the same problem in a different perspective. So this is uh, some, some, I think one of the, the, the most uh, uh, remarkable features of the lab, I'd say. Uh, and what the lab does, so we try to bridge this gap between the physical and social layer that make our cities, but also uh, the digital and social layers that we live in our daily lives and are changing the way the ways we deal with cities. So how we create these connections is basically the, the, the goal of the lab. But also we have this theoretical approach to technology and cities. Uh, we work heavily on data, as you're going to see in some of the projects that I show you, that I will show you. But also, we have a, a very hands-on approach. And this very hands-on approach, what I like it, uh, about this is the following. So if you see on your top right uh, an image of four uh, women, women uh, doing some, some, some sampling in a, in, a, in a sewage in Boston, uh, they were involved in building the, the sampling, in designing the research, in collecting the, the, the samples and doing the analysis. And two of them uh, created out of this project a very successful startup called Biobot that had, ha, has already been invested in tens of millions of dollars in the United States. So it's a very hands-on research, but we try also to, to see if out of any research, there is a potential business. Uh, and in the central figure, the bottom one, we see a colleague, Amin. So he came to the lab and stayed two years with us as a visiting professor. And what I also like about uh, MIT in general and the lab in particular, but it can be found, found anywhere at MIT, to be honest, is that uh, we don't care if the person comes as an undergrad researcher or as a visiting professor, if the person wants to do uh, research, we treat all of them equally. And I mean, even though he has a, 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 a higher position academically, he was there assembling sensors uh, on top of trucks, driving the truck. So it was his research. He, 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 he made this project his own project. And this is quite uh, nice about the lab. Uh, but the lab also is very involved in, 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 in communicating what we do. So because we believe that, okay, it's important to write very strong academic papers because then we can make our contribution within the academic community, but also how to make this research not only accessible to the general public, but also to get the public involved uh, in the research, being at least enticed by scientific knowledge. And we think that doing this sort of uh, beautiful uh, data visualizations uh, and what we call science storytelling is the way we bring people to engage with our work. And I'll tell you uh, three projects. The first one is called Desirable Streets. And Desirable Streets, uh, we, we, we start from a very simple question, actually. Uh, we had a, a collaboration with an app called Breeze. Now they, they, they had been bought by another of these tracking, self-tracking companies, I forgot the name, but Breeze basically, uh, as any of these maps, uh, it was tracking your, 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 your steps during the day. So eventually you're going to receive, okay, today you made 10,000 steps, you walk this way, you walk that way, this is your speed, whatever. And then once we had, and we had the profile of the users, so age, gender, for instance. So first we mapped all the paths of pedestrians in Boston. Uh, we had for Boston and San Francisco. So we mapped all the paths. And one thing that we found uh, is that about 20% of the paths don't follow the shortest path. Meaning that if I want to go from point A to point B, from any point A to any point B, uh, there is uh, a shortest path, right? We would expect people to deciding to take the shortest path. However, 20% of people don't take the shortest path. 
and we started two uh, uh, parallel research uh, uh, with the same data set. One, uh, a paper that has been published very recently, uh, was trying to see if there was any geometric feature of the streets that could explain why people who did not take the shortest path were choosing the other path, the longest paths. Uh, and in this case, our question in the desirable streets uh, was, is there any explanation why some street segments in the city attract more pedestrians among those who don't take the shortest path? So this is very important, the, the sequence. So we, we have all, we have all the, 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 the path. We collect, we first, we separate only the path taken by those who did not take the shortest path. So for some reason, people deviated from the shortest path. Okay, now we have a subset of path. Among this known shortest path, are there any urban explanation why people decide to take these street segments? Why people, is there any urban explanation that made people deviate from their shortest path? So what we did, uh, we could say, mm, perhaps uh, people were trying to walk along or avoid these roads. They were trying to, to visit or at least pass in front of shops or any other amenity and access to green spaces could attract people. Oh, let's take a, 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 another path, just then we can pass uh, along this park here, for instance. And then how we did that, obviously we collect all the data provided by the city itself. So the open data uh, of uh, Boston and Cambridge, but also we collected all the, the uh, points of interest using Foursquare, Google uh, Places. Uh, we also uh, quantify all uh, uh, building heights and uh, number of trees using Google Street View image. So in a previous project that we did called Treepedia, we start quantifying uh, greenery in cities using Google Street View images. So using all this data, we start uh, uh, understanding what attracts people to some uh, segments. And I will play this very short video here because before telling some of the results, because in our website now, what you can see is that you select any pair. We select a few more exemplar pairs, but you can select the pair. And once you select the pair, you, you, you follow both paths. On the one hand, you follow the shortest path. And on the other hand, you follow the taken path. And as you can imagine, the, the right with a, a black bar on top is the shortest path. And the left is the path actually taken by people who deviated from the shortest path. And if slowly you start seeing, mm, interesting, uh, the, the, the longest path, they don't have these bridges they, they, they have more openings, more trees, better sidewalks. So everything that's pretty intuitive for us, right? Uh, if you only by watching these videos, you could more or less guess which path was the one taken from, from those deviating from the shortest path. But what was uh, for us more important, obviously in the paper that we, uh, we published, we start quantifying, not only say, oh yes, Trees attract more pedestrians, is, or access to parks attract more pedestrians, even though if they were not going to the park. So we eliminate all the all these features that were destinations. So if the park was a destination, it was not part of our sample. Only if the person had deviated from the shortest path just to walk along the park. But even though this is very intuitive. Uh, the contribution is that we could quantify this is how much the presence of a park make, makes people deviate from the shortest path. This is how much sidewalk uh, and street furniture 
contributes to making people walk in one street more than another, even though they need to deviate from the shortest path. And finally, uh, access to business. And one thing that we, we found uh, quite interesting uh, is that, as we might understand, the presence of one restaurant attract, could attract pedestrians to deviate. Two or three perhaps would attract more people than only one, but then there is a saturation point. So the number of business from the same uh, uh, characteristic, like the number of restaurants, they, 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 they slowly reach a saturation point. So if, if a street segment has four restaurants or eight restaurants, it does not influence anymore attracting more pedestrians. And this has been very, so this project, we are now continuing this project uh, and one of the, 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 the outcomes outside the scientific part is that several uh, real estate companies uh, start coming and say, okay, oh, if, if you can, uh, if I can understand what influence people coming to, to a place or, or another, I can even promote these things with the city because then I would know that uh, I, I would give this contribution, this public contribution, but in exchange, I will have more pedestrians walking along my business. Okay, now the second project, it's quite, uh, I like it a lot, and it's a very opportunistic project. So the first one is also about what we call opportunistic data. Opportunistic data is data that is out there. We haven't collected ourselves. What we did is simply elaborate a research question and finding the data to answer this question. And in this case, uh, in, in the desirable street case, sorry, the data came first. We had the data, and then we start elaborating different research questions using the same data set. In this case, it was the opposite. We thought, okay, oh, when the pandemic uh, started, let's say around March, thousand uh, March, no, yes, around February 2019, more or less, uh, March, April, I would say, just to, 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 to rethink all the, the we started hearing uh, in newspapers, journalists saying, oh, now streets are, are more silent, we can hear birds and we can uh, stop hearing traffic. So yeah, that's true. But can we quantify what has actually changed in the city's soundscape. So uh, how to do that? Because now everybody were in lockdown. So we can remember how the sound of city was, but could we actually quantify how, this, how the sound of city was and to compare with how the sound of city is now? So what we did first, we went to YouTube and we found that there are lots of people who just walk along parks, filming their trajectory with a cell phone. And we call, hey man, here I am walking in Central Park and whatever. And in the background, we can hear everything. We can hear people walking, we can hear people chatting, we can hear children playing, we can hear birds. And obviously we can hear the sound background of the city around this park, right? And after we found this for uh, Central Square in New York, we said, mm, perhaps other parks in the world has the same thing. And then we, we start uh, uh, scavenging for, for, for YouTube videos ab uh, about people walking uh, along parks with a, a good uh, background sound. Uh, and then we decide to stay with five, so we had Boston, New York, San Francisco, Singapore, London, and Milan. And after that, we asked for some colleagues, some volunteers, if they could go there to the same park during the pandemic, so it was May and June, uh, go to the same park, take exactly the same route, because we could map 
using the YouTube, we could map exactly the routes that the person had taken on the park. And we start recording the same thing. And once we recorded, we found the following. Oh, look, this was, uh, okay, this is a, was a, a already known. We knew that everything has, ha, has declined in usage, but parks, even though they had declined, they were the first to, to go back, let's say, to life. So in June, you see all of them, they were below baseline, and then parks, they are already uh, above baseline. And why? Because as you remember, we are all in lock, lockdown, and we did not have anywhere to go, parks were only one of the only few places in cities available. So you see that in June, uh, trends was still way below the baseline. Workplaces have some peaks, but they were below, whereas parks, people had resumed going. So we ask our volunteers, go there, take the same route, record it, and send us the video with sound. And we found, let me play here briefly with you. I think you can hear a noise. The interesting thing here is that if you go on our website, you can click each line and hear the background noise, the noise or the sound. And why this difference between noise and sound is important for us? For a few reasons. One of them, is, let me just skip to the end because it will be, a, uh, you can go there. But why this is important for us? Because in our case, we did not want to know if the city was quieter than before only, but we did want to know which sounds we could hear in a city and uh, how we did that. Also going to the internet, we have several, several uh, sound libraries. In the sound libraries, we have different types of birds, dogs, people walking, chanting, fighting, whatever, we have all the sounds. So we use the sounds and we create a, a training data set. And then we had all the sounds that we collect with three passages of YouTube. So from each park, before the pandemic, in May, in June. And then we could uh, discretize the sounds that we're hearing. So we could say, look, in May, we could hear more adults, walking in parks, but in June, we could already hear children playing in parks or the sirens start wenting up because we could hear this, the, the, this, the, the background sound and we had the, the train that I said. So we could uh, understand each city or at least each region along these parks in, this, in the cities only through sound. So for us, this research was a, a, what we call a kind of a quick research. We did not take long to, to do a full paper, but it was more for two reasons. One is to try to, to use, uh, um, for in our case, to use machine learning techniques, not only to analyze images in cities as we had been doing uh, for a few years uh, now with uh, street view image, for instance, but also using a similar technique to understand the sounds of cities. And the second reason that for us was very important is that uh, sound is not often used in urban uh, studies. Uh, and we would like to try to see if we could use not only uh, uh, visual data, for instance, to, to understand a city, but also uh, sound data. And this is why we, we did the research and uh, it was pretty uh, successful. And then we had also some media coverage, including the New York Times when we did the, 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 the New York part of that. And then you can go online and you can see how sound, how sound has changed in each of these cities uh, uh, during the pandemic. And finally, Fabio, uh, I think I have time yet, right? Yes, that's fine. Okay, and then I will talk about Robo. And Robo uh, is the last project and it changes completely. So the two first projects, it is more a data, uh, a data heavy type of uh, project, but we haven't built anything. In robot, 
the challenge is different. Even though we did have to collect and analyze huge amounts of data, as I will show you, uh, but the challenge was a little bit bigger. I would say much bigger. So uh, six years ago, the city of Amsterdam came to MIT uh, exploring a possible collaboration. And as many cities in the world, uh, Amsterdam, they were trying to prepare itself to, to receive autonomous vehicles and also probably invest in autonomous mobility. And when they came to us um, with, uh, because uh, this project is a collaboration also with two Dutch universities, Wageningen and Delft. And together with MIT, we created the AMS Institute. And we suggested them, why should you uh, develop any autonomous cars in a city uh, where you have 100 kilometers of canals? What we propose instead is to create a fleet of autonomous boats, which we call rowboat. And obviously the challenge of having rowboats in Amsterdam, autonomous boats in Amsterdam is pretty substantial. First, you can see this image here. Look, it's pretty, uh, it's a summer day in Amsterdam. So it's pretty impossible to navigate there if you don't, if you're not a, a, a very good pilot. The first thing that we did, we collected data about boat traffic in the city. So we also uh, had a collaboration in a company who provided us the data and they collect this data uh, regularly. And we start mapping the traffic in different times of the day, in different days of the week, and we have some hotspots. And why we did that? The, because the first step of this autonomous navigation is to send a, a robot from one point to the other. So before I tell the boat, oh, go from point A to point B, these data help us, helps us to, uh, to uh, decide the best route. So this is the, what is called in, in the, the area, global path planning. So we have several rowboats, we have all this traffic, we have to send uh, rowboats one, two, three, four to points A, B, C, D, E, uh, from points uh, E, F, G, K, how do you send these boats? And they find, uh, with this data, we found the best path, fine. Then, uh, while we were doing this type of uh, research, at MIT, we were creating the autonomous boats themselves. So Fabio uh, knows these boats well, because they were all uh, around the lab. And these are very small boats. They're one, one meter by uh, 50 centimeters. And they have all this LIDAR, this technology to make them autonomous if they were autonomous. But also what you can see here is that the boats, they are very close together. Actually, they're latched together. And this is one important characteristics of these boats. Um, we want to create not only a, a, a boat, but also what we have to call a floating platform then the boats could come together, latch, and create bridges or stages. Uh, and why this is important? Let me explain you uh, two uh, 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 applications. One of them is very trivial, but in Amsterdam, they have 1,000 bridges. But in some days, in very specific days, like the King's Day, you have so many visitors that the bridges are not enough to, to move all people around. So the idea is that, okay, what if we can create these temporary bridges and boats could come together and create these temporary bridges. But also sometimes we have to create some stages, uh, floating platforms. If I have some, some accidents in a Bay Area, uh, then the boats can come create this, this floating platform and we can use this as a basis to smaller operations in the water while we are dealing with some emergency situations. But we had to make this boat navigate in the city of Amsterdam. So at the same time, oh, let me just put the sound a little bit lower. So this is a, a boat with a LiDAR. It's a laser scanning. So probably every, all of you know, but it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a equipment where you have some laser beams spinning around and collecting all these uh, cloud points. You form these cloud points. So what we're doing, we're measuring the distance between the device 
and the first obstacle. Then we have the, the, the drone also doing this scanning, and then we can combine uh, different techniques to, to label what uh, we have in these point clouds, from cars to bridges to boats. And this is obviously very important for boat navigation, because otherwise we'll be hitting anything. But more importantly than, than not more important, but surprisingly important, I would say, for the city is that we thought we'll be using this technology only to help the boat to navigate. However, here you can see the street level, if you see my mouse, and then you have the water, right? The city of Amsterdam, they have a very precise map, LiDAR map of the city, but they did this map uh, uh, aerial LiDAR mapping of the sea. The problem, as you might imagine, is that water reflects the light laser beam, and they don't have any information about what happens between the street level and the water level. So rowboat, by continuous navigating the city, would be the first technology to map with the LiDAR precision all the canal walls of Amsterdam. And why this is important? Because they are collapsing. So the city of Amsterdam will be spending, I believe it's $20 billion in the next few years to maintain and restore in some cases, some canal walls. So having this very precise mapping would help them a lot to know where they should act first. And uh, finally, oops, and then uh, we thought, okay, but what, what can we do with this boat? So uh, the, what we did, we started engaging people to, to imagine different futures for Amsterdam. So we had these workshops where people would, were using paper-based materials sometimes to create some different use cases. Uh, and then using this, the, this paper-based uh, design thinking type of uh, research, we also uh, went a step further and decided to create uh, this virtual reality environment for some of the solutions. Uh, so then we could put people on board to see their reaction. And then we even published a paper uh, uh, in the Journal of Urban Technology where we, we measure uh, the stress level of people navigating exactly the same situation in Amsterdam using a virtual boat where they could see a captain controlling the movements and everything exactly the same but a, a, a boat without a captain. And, and then by measuring this we, we found that a boat with a captain uh, gives more confidence to people uh, in the first 40 seconds and after that, people simply disregards whether the boat is autonomous or not. And Fabio, to finish, I'd like to show something that uh, uh, you, you remember the, all the, the small boats, the HB, and then uh, by the end of October, so less than two months ago, we launched the actual full-scale rowboats. This is Lucy. Lucy is a rowboat a fully autonomous, zero-emission boat that operates on urban waterways, and she can change the way cities work. As congestion and emissions continue to rise, while cities continue to grow, the existing infrastructure of many cities struggles to keep up. Rowboats offer a solution by moving road traffic to the water. By bringing passengers from A to B, or as an on-demand boat, taking you anywhere you want. And they can also help the city as a multi-purpose work boat. Take Crystal. She is equipped to collect household waste to free the streets from heavy garbage trucks. Robots are fully autonomous, so they navigate without a skipper and can operate 24-7. In order to sail by themselves, robots need to perceive their environment and recognize objects such as bridge pillars, floating objects, and of course, other vessels. The primary source of information comes from a LiDAR sensor, but robots are also equipped with cameras, GPS, and a digital compass. 
Robots onboard computer combines and processes all of the data and runs the Robot software so it can successfully complete its mission plan. After five years of development, testing and experimentation, we have now successfully enabled autonomy on the full-scale prototypes. Robot is ready for the next step. Join us and let's unlock the potential of urban waterways together. So that's it. So thank you very much. And I'd be happy to answer any questions if you have. Okay, great. Thank you very much. People can either just raise your hand or just speak or type the questions you have. There. And I see that Alfredo has raised his hand. So please go ahead, Alfredo. Uh, thank you, Fabio, for the great presentation. I was wondering on the first example, if you try something quite simple, that means try to find point of interest and find if there is shortest path between this point of interest. There is a longer path, you get a point of interest and two shortest paths. Does it happen? Yeah, that's uh, that's a good suggestion. What we we, we try to, to find there is with actual path that people have taken. So we were not simulating any of the path. So all the paths that you saw on the map, people had taken this path. And, and our goal was simply trying to explain, try to explain why, perhaps why, yeah, why people have chosen a longest path. So we, what you suggest could be uh, interesting to, to do some simulations, but it was not our intention. We have never changed any, any path. This is the beauty of having data. With the data, it's quite easy to do it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Okay, speaking of sound, we have a helicopter on top of us now. Yeah, I heard that. <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, but I, I have a, a short question. Why are you are presenting uh, the, the shortest path thing, the first project? I immediately came to my mind the idea of doing the opposite, having an, an app, a cell phone app in which the user uh, set his or her preferences about the things that he likes to do and to see. And the, the app suggests uh, the path that I should take. Uh, have you guys thought about doing something like that? Yeah, we, we have. And then actually we found some, uh, some apps around saying, oh, because currently for instance, Google, in, we, it does not work for all the cities, right? But for instance, uh, in some cities where you also have topography, then you can set not only, oh, I, I, I prefer to walk uh, next to green areas, or I prefer to, to, to avoid uh, high steeps. So all these type of things you can set up, and then the app would say, okay, you are gonna, this is the shortest path, but based on your preferences, this is the, the, the path that we, we suggest you. Yeah. Unfortunately, depending on the city, it will, it will need to rely on the data that is available for the city. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, Marcus Endler from Book Rio has a question. Yes. <clears throat> uh, so good afternoon and thank you very much for the nice talk, Fabio. Eduardo, it was very nice. Uh, I, I have some, some questions. I mean, uh, the first example of, of the shortest path, uh, which is obviously uh, important in the city. Have you considered that in the, in, in the city uh, there might, uh, might happen some events, some unexpected uh, events that we have here in Rio de Janeiro, for example, all the, all the time, some, some uh, some uh, chiroteo, some uh, firing, and so and so. You have to 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 give advice to the, the pedestrians not to to go on this part. This is one uh, one question, and the other uh, uh, question regarding the the robot. I didn't get exactly why the need 
to be uh, autonomous. So why couldn't you just have a, a driver there? Is it uh, so expensive to have a, a driver for those uh, tourist boat? I mean, the, the tourists which come to Amsterdam, they not only want to go on a boat, they want to talk to someone, maybe to a local guy there. So Yeah, good. So uh, for the let me exp answer it in order. So for the first one, uh, we did not uh, consider the events. We are using uh, one one year of data. So mm -hmm. this was the average uh, path that people have taken, the shortest uh, uh, and the the actual the actual path. But uh, a long, very long, long time ago, I'm putting here the chat. This is one of the first projects that the lab did. It's called uh, Real Time Rome, and in this uh, project, what uh, was done at the time, uh, obviously you're going to see that the visualization is is very old and so, but the video is still very beautiful. But basically, uh, uh, the lab was measuring uh, the impact of some events. In this case, the final of the World Cup and a Madonna concert in Rome and how it changed the, the, the place of the city that were most used by, by pedestrians. So how events change places used by people in the city. So I think what you said would be super cool actually to implement. So if you have, a, a, let's say, a Google Map uh, type of app, that is not only giving you a device based on fixed uh, features yeah. of the city, but also in, 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 in event, eventful features of the city, right? Yeah, it's very nice, very good idea. And for the, the second one, yes, the, the, the boat, right? Uh, so it's true that for some, uh, you go to Amsterdam, you take a boat and then somebody is explaining to you, uh, it, it might be very nice. Uh, but for instance, for those tourism boats, one thing that we, we found is that they cannot, when we go there as a tourist, we, we see in the morning those tourist boats around, right? But then they are docked 45 minutes away from the city. So every day they have to, to pay a skipper, a skipper just to bring the boat I see, I see. To, to, then they start the, the, tourist, the tourism itself. So uh, eventually we believe we're going to have a combination of human driven boats and autonomous boats mm -hmm. in the city. Okay, thank you very much, Fabio. Thank you. Okay, so our, our last question is yes. from Alessandro Santiago, who asked if the urban information that you collected had some impact from the GDPR privacy regulations, if there's any discussion about that. And I, when you were mentioning collecting sounds and noise, I imagine that there are many other kinds of sounds and noises that we like to collect and analyze, but uh, what about uh, privacy? Does it have any implication there? Yeah, so that's a, a very good, uh, because uh, GDPR has been a, a very important topic for several of our research, actually. Uh, and to the point, as you can imagine, sometimes we have to, to, to run we develop some, some software and then we run them in Europe because we have several partners in Europe because we cannot have the data here. With the, U with the Sonic Cities, what was much easier because uh, we went there and we collected all the data, except what happened before the pandemic. And in this case, what we did, uh, that's why also we limited the parts. We wrote to, because even though somebody has uploaded the, the, the video on YouTube, uh, you still own the, 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 the data. So in this case, we, we found, because of YouTube, you have who you are, and then we have restricted ourselves to those uh, videos where we could identify the, the, the owner of the video, the one who uploaded that. Then we asked the video to the person. So this was our way around, okay, we're not using the person shared the data with us, basically. So then we can do whatever we want. Okay, but then, then I guess if you capture someone speaking and talking, then oh yeah, then be it's, careful yeah. with what you do with that. Yeah, exactly, exactly. 
But whatever you go, somebody is with a, a cell phone uh, recording <laughs> what you're saying. Okay, thank, thank you, you very much, Fabio. It was very nice. Ho I hope next year we'll be here in, in person. person. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. And so we'll now go to the short presentations that we have from our group. Thank you, Fabio. Thank you. Bye.